this goes back a little further than the last trip. It, it involves this substance that was so kindly brought to me by Ellie here. This is called water. And um, <laughs> you may not know it, water has memory. Did you know that? Yes. Tell me something. <laughs> a man named Jacques Benveniste uh, did some tests over there that were published in Nature magazine with the provision in the middle of the article that they published it only because he had agreed that an independent team sponsored by Nature and paid for by Nature would go in there and see how his tests were being done. We did indeed, and we showed there were serious problems with the protocol, and he's still arguing it to this very day. The theory of homeopathy. I will share this with you. I won't go into, again, the whole thing. It's very involved. These things are never simple. You know, it's not like gravity. Things fall down. No. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's always much more complicated than that. There are about four premises of homeopathy I will share with you. First of all, you go back 220 years to Samuel Hahnemann in Switzerland. Think of the social system of the day and the social situation. Medicine was in its infancy. It was barely started. They were barely away from Paracelsus, who made the wonderful discovery that you could use as medication non-organic substances. Up until then, pretty well, everything had been organic substances. He was using metallic salts, simple salts, mercuric chloride, lead acetate, things like that. He was treating the patients with these substances. Uh, it cured the disease very effectively. Unfortunately, the patients all died. <laughs> so they had the best looking corpses in the hospital. But they had clear complexions, no symptoms whatsoever, and they made beautiful corpses. Now, Paracelsus actually, you've got to admire him, he's one of the heroes of medicine because he was brave, he was a self-centered, arrogant idiot, but other than that, he was okay. As a scientist, he really did do some thinking about it, and he was experimenting. Of course, he was experimenting on human beings that weren't in his family, but nonetheless, he was experimenting. And he did discover some very useful things and started people out on a new way of studying medicine. But in those days, back 220 years ago, all over Europe, all over the civilized world, indeed, more patients were dying uh, under the hands of the doctors than were dying without the doctors. Poor people couldn't afford doctors and self-terminating diseases, things that they could recover from, that their immune system or natural processes would eventually bring to a close, either by death or from recovery, were taking place naturally. While the doctors were bleeding people and doing pretty ridiculous, ridiculous things with their bodies and giving them a lot of poisonous compounds as well. Which, all the way, they were poisonous, in some cases in small doses, seemed to have been effective. So it was encouraging. But think what happens now when this man Hahnemann comes along with a wonderful theory that you don't have to give noxious substances to people, that ordinary water will do the job. Those people are effectively going to be receiving no treatment whatsoever, and they are going to join the group that is going to have a higher survival rate, people who don't go to doctors at all. The theory was this. It's a theory of sort of sympathies and likes curing like. The idea is that if you, this is the way they did their studies, they would take a healthy patient, that's a bit of terminology I can't quite define, but a patient who looked healthy, they bring him in, they say, okay, I want you to swallow this. And they'd give him something like extract of dandelion or extract of sand or extract of, well, they'll say extract of dandelion, that's a little less hard to choke down. So they give him that and he develops symptoms. We'll say the symptoms are A, B, and C, and those symptoms are breaking out a red rash all over your body, uh, shaking violently like that, and fainting every 20 minutes. Those are pretty serious uh, symptoms, you see. Suppose those are the three symptoms. He writes that down in his book. When they take the dandelion extract, they get these symptoms. A healthy person, that is. So then he waits, and he waits, and waits, and waits, and finally a patient comes in among many patients and says, Doctor, I got a problem. There are three symptoms. What are your symptoms? Well, every 20 minutes or so, I fall down on the floor. Wait a minute. Got that in my book someplace here. You ever suffer from red rash? Yeah, I'm in a red rash all over my body. Oh, good. There was, I know there was one here someplace in the experimentation. And uh, I keep, well... They describe as symptoms A, B, and C, and he says, Eureka, le voila, we have a solution for you. You're going to be cured by extract of dandelion, but wait a minute, second rule of homeopathy. You don't really give them the dandelion. What you do is you give them what they call diluted or attenuated solution of the dandelion. Now, I mean attenuated, folks. <laughs> they use terms like attenuated, and they use uh, terms like, uh, there's my chalk, they use... Um, terms like attenuated and diluted. Now, in order to be diluted, you've got to have, not diluted, diluted. Uh, <laughs> diluted is easy. But diluted, you've got to have a solvent and you've got to have a solute. 
The solvent is the liquid or whatever or the larger amount of substance, and the solute is what's dissolved in it. Okay, if you don't have one of those elements, you haven't got a solution. You've got only a solvent or a solute. Well, they, they have attenuations of various degrees. Now, I'm not going to trouble you with powers of 10 and all that sort of thing, but if they take one part of the substance and put it in 10 parts of water and shake it up, it's called secessing, not shaking up. They've got to have a technical term for it. A certain way it's got to be shaken, and then what you've got is called a one solution, okay? That's called a one solution. If you take one part of that and put it in 10 parts of water, it's one part in 100 now, that's called a two solution. So it's directly related to the number of zeros on the amount of water, the comparative amount of water. So if you have a five solution, it's five zeros after the one and one part of substance in that. Now as soon as you get up around 23, 24, 27 and such, depending on the substance, you get to what they call Avogadro's limit. This guy Avogadro was a troublemaker way back when, and he came up with this limit which says that there's only, at that point, for that particular substance, there's a chance in the solution you now have of there being one molecule of that substance present. If you do it again, you got one more order, one more dilution, there's one chance in 10 of there being one molecule of the substance in this liter or whatever of water. Well, folks, the homeopathy people start off at a dilution of 10 to the 50th, generally speaking. <laughs> there are 10 to the 23rd stars in the universe. That's what I call dilute. Oh, but you ain't heard dilute yet. They go all the way up to 10 to the power of 1,500. That's extremely dilute. <laughs> now look at what that means. I called my friend Martin Gardner and said, Martin, I really need something for the layman. I don't know what 10 to the 1500th is. It's a huge number, very, very, very large number, but how do I illustrate that? He said, I'll call you back. Later on the day, he called me back. He said, okay, you got a pencil, a pencil ready? I said, yep. He paused for a minute. He said, no, I'm going to call you back. He said, this can't possibly be right. It's ridiculous. 20 minutes later, he called me back. He said, no, I was right first time. He said, it's equivalent to, I hope you're ready for this, I haven't told you the, the fourth quality of homeopathy. Oh, but the third one is, by the way, the more dilute the medicine is, the more powerful it is. So as you get up to 1,500, it's getting more and more powerful. It works the other way. We might think it would work the opposite way, but apparently not. And the fourth rule, you still haven't heard. Wait till you hear that. That's a, that's a doozy. Martin said, if you take one grain of rice, crush it up in a teaspoon, you then dissolve that powder in a sphere of water the size of the solar system with the sun at the center and the orbit of Pluto at the outside, then you repeat that process two billion times. <laughs> now there are naturally, as might have occurred to you, a couple of technical problems here. First of all, how are you going to mix it? Maybe you could do it just with a stick. Where the hell do you get the stick? And you have to mix it for billions and billions of years, as Carl would say. You have to stir it for a long time, and it's very difficult to mix it up, but nonetheless, that's what it calls for to get that kind of dilution. Now for the fourth rule of homeopathy. Every molecule of water which you have so prepared, when it comes in contact with any other molecule of water, immediately passes on its quality to all of that water. I have a question. Now, I'm only a layman, but boy, I got terrible questions to ask these people. And I've asked them this, and they say it's a non-significant question, and they refuse to address it. Since water has been around for billions and billions of years, all of what I've got in this little cup of water here, a lot of that's been around for billions and billions of years. And in this process, it must have come upon contact with other molecules that have been in contact with lots of other molecules which have been in contact with each and every possible organic and inorganic substance available on planet Earth. And since the more dilute it is, the more powerful it is, I feel much better. <laughs> What's wrong with that question? Why don't you give them ordinary tap water then? No, they'll give them extract of cadmium or something like that, which, don't fear, it has no cadmium in it. It's the purest water you're ever going to drink. There's no way, and they admit, there is no way of telling the cadmium attenuated solution, ho-ho, 
with the lead attenuated solution, with the gold attenuated solution, and they even have substances like sulfur and uh, sand, quartz, ordinary quartz, which doesn't dissolve in water to any appreciable extent at all. You shake one part of quartz or ten parts of water, try to detect the quartz, friends. I ask you by the most sensitive of tests, but they say it works. Oh, really? Does it really work? Well, the people who report it works. What about the people who die? Well, I didn't hear from them. <laughs> For more of James Randi and the Educational Foundation, make sure you visit randy.org.